And maybe you still have your finger or thumb in Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm going to look at one or two verses in Ephesians chapter 5 together this morning. And we already read a, a good portion of chapter Ephesians chapter 5. And looking at uh, two verses in verse 11 and 12. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. And Father, we do ask your blessing as we come to your word. Lord, when we say your blessing, Lord, that you would help us to understand, Lord, that you would help us to walk in your word, and Lord, that you would uh, draw us to to indeed be obedient children, walking in the light. And through the Lord Jesus we ask, amen. Amen. Uh, Some, maybe a couple weeks back now, it hasn't been too long, I was uh, reading the different news reports, and usually I I read the news just about every day. And there was uh, the the tragedy there up in Leakslip, it was about over a year ago now, and it had everyone uh, shocked and taken back because of the ages, uh, not only of the, the victim, but also the ages of those that did the, the terrible things that were done. And as I would go through the different news sites or whatever, um, when those that did the deed, were apprehended, and then they were charged, and then it went to trial, and day by day there were reports of this and that, and and I really didn't uh, follow it, and I didn't read it, I would just see the headline, but I didn't go into the story. But um, I guess a couple weeks ago now, the story came out that it had been concluded, and they were found guilty, and then it, the the article said what had been done, and I really didn't have a clue. I knew that a murder had taken place. I had known that young teenagers were involved. But when I finally just read the conclusion, uh, like many of you, if you have followed it or read it, I was just uh, shocked and taken back how um, you know such 13-year-olds, one 13-year-old could go to another young teen and say, do you want to kill someone? and then plan and orchestrate it and, and then uh, carry it out. And one headline was that they couldn't talk about God or Jesus, but only Satan, and you're taken back. And how could these things be? And then the article would go on to say these words that I think were said over and over in different articles. It was torture, rape, and murder. The things I'm going to talk about today, they're, they're going to be raw, and they're going to be brutal, probably not things that you would expect to hear at a nice church meeting on a a nice Sunday morning. But again, the verse that came to my mind is, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them or expose them. And it says, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. It seems like there's a balance there. You're to expose them, but it's also shameful to even discuss some of the things. So I won't go into uh, too much detail here. But I I will make a statement, and probably initially many might disagree with it, and um, maybe even say it's, it's not right to say. But what I would state is certainly there was the victim of the little girl that the things that happened to her. But I would also say that the two young boys who were I think both, one or both were 13 at the time, that they too were victims. They too were victims. And um, by saying that I'm not saying that they were not responsible for what they had done. Um, And I'll explain why I would say they were victims because they're the the fruit of the culture that we live in. We have the chickens. I didn't know too much about anything about chickens. And um, 
I had nice flowers planted around the property and all that. And when Hazel, you found out I was getting chickens, she said, oh, Brian, you're gonna tear up your flower beds. I didn't know anything about chickens. <laughs> oy, oy, oy. You know how they tore up the, Hazel was a prophet. They tore this <laughs> up and dug and burrowed and, and all this and that. But I had heard an expression in the past and I didn't really think too much about it or understand it, but it was that the chickens have come home to roost. I'm sure everybody has heard that. Chickens have come home to roost. And I let the chickens out and they wander around the property. They go far and they go wide. And one of them was even, had copped on how to go under the, the gate and to go out the front and they're going through the hedge here to my neighbor and he's getting eggs or he got an egg or whatever. And um, so the chickens come home to roost. And right when it gets dark, I know where to find them. Wherever they go far and wide, they come back and they go in their box. And basically all I have to do is just close the door and they're, they're in for the night, close the doors. And I was thinking of that uh, when I said that these young boys, that they were, were uh, uh, victims. And I think that the chickens have come home to roost in our culture, in our society. And I'm just going to read something. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And maybe a few weeks back I had mentioned some of these things before because of another topic. But I'm going to mention them again. And by reading some of these things, this is by no means isolated or remote. This is just the tip of the iceberg of the media, of the entertainment culture in the day and age in which we live. And um, I... We don't have a television at home, but we do have our computers, that's dangerous enough. And we don't have the cable, we don't have the HBO, and I don't have Netflix and, and Sky and any of that stuff. Um, I have trouble enough with YouTube and the internet as it is for myself. But um, one of the things that, that I've heard just a couple of months ago is all the excitement and all the attention and all the focus on Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones this and Game of Thrones that, Game of Thrones this and the tourism industry and it's the big buzz and how it was all going to end and it was the story and it was the, the happening thing, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones, uh, which I had never seen. Um, so I went on Wikipedia and to see what's all the excitement about, Game of Thrones. So, so it's just an encyclopedia uh, on the internet and this is what all the buzz is about. This is what the millions upon millions are consuming and drinking in and meditating on, filling their hearts, their souls and minds and going after and wondering what's the next episode going to be. And, and these are just some, on Wikipedia, you can read the, the whole review or the story yourself if you want. I'm just going to just have some picked out things. And this is what all the excitement and the buzz is about. Um, the show for the amount of female nudity, violence, and sexual violence it depicts. Uh, the second season appeared to focus on distasteful, exploitative, exploitative, and dehumanizing sex with little informational content. In the third season, which saw Theon Greyjoy lengthily tortured and eventually emasculated, the series was also criticized for its use of torture. New York Magazine called the scene torture porn. Madeline Davies of Jezebel uh, agreed, saying, it's not uncommon that Game of Thrones gets accused of being torture porn, senseless, objectifying violence combined with senseless, objectifying sexual imagery. A scene in the fourth season's episode Breaker of Chains, in which Jamie Lannister rapes his sister and lover Curse, uh, triggered broad public discussion about the series' depiction of sexual violence against women. Rape has become so pervasive in the drama that it is almost background noise, a routine and unshocking occurrence. In the fifth season's episode, Unbowed, Unbent, Unbroken, Sansa Stark is raped by Ramsay Bolton. And so that's just some of the 
thing from Wikipedia explaining about what all the buzz and all the excitement is about. And then it goes on to say, fans, of what I've just read here, the fan, people that are really, uh, really into this, fans include political leaders such as former U.S. President Barack Obama, former British Prime Minister David Cameron, former Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard, if I'm saying her name right, and Dutch Foreign Minister Franz Timmermans, who framed European politics in quotes from Martin's novels in a 2013 speech. BBC News said in 2013 that the passion and the extreme devotion of fans has created a phenomenon unlike anything related to other popular TV series manifesting itself in fan fiction. And then lastly, the awards. 2013, the Writers Guild of America listed Game of Thrones as the best written series in television history. 2015, Hollywood Reporter placed it number four on their best TV shows ever list. 2016, the series was placed seventh on Empire's The 50 Best TV Shows Ever, and etc., 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 etc. And then one word that comes out in these, um, the part of the Wikipedia story about the, the awards is outstanding. They received 13 Emmy nominees, outstanding drama series, outstanding supporting actor in a drama series. Um, outstanding main title design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as we go on there. And I think the chickens have come home to roost. Um, that's just one program. And there's other things that come on uh, this magazine, that magazine. There was, uh, I just saw it, I get um, Answers in Genesis, a answers in Genesis uh, email update every every day just about Ken Ham. Many of you are familiar with him, and he just made mention of Teen Vogue, which I guess is a magazine for teen girls. Uh, that and whether it was their latest issue, I, I assume it was. But there's an article there that that sex work is legitimate work. That these are this is a sort this is an employment that's legitimate, and this is going to female teenagers, and um, et cetera, et cetera, and other little examples I could put on there and speak about, but we won't. Hopefully this is enough, just the tip of the iceberg of what I read. What I, I don't understand is that we're drinking this in, uh, this culture and our society, and it's, and it's burning into our, our conscience and our souls, and then when children, 13-year-olds, they're exposed to it, they see it, and then they think about it, they meditate on it, and then they plan it, and they do it. And that's why I said that those two young boys were victims. I saw another article, and just the headline said something like about this trial and what had happened, and it, the article was, what does this say about us? So I thought, well, here's somebody who maybe has their finger on the pulse. What does this say about us? And here it had not really didn't have too much to do about what I was saying here. It, it uh, expressed another reason why these things were happening from, from what I remember. Now you're liable to think, you know, I'm up here on a Sunday, I got the pulpit, and I'm preaching against Game of Thrones, and I'm preaching against this, that, and the other, and that. And I'm really, I'm not. And my point is what I am speaking about, my point here is something that Paul had said back in, uh, First Corinthians, he was speaking about the difference between the church and the world. And his concern for the believers in Corinth was they were acting just like the world. There wasn't too much difference between what you see people in the world doing and people, what they're doing, that they're a part of the church. And to remember that the word church means called out. To be in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ means that we've been called out out of the world. When you called on, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you became a saint, meaning a, a, a holy to be called out. When you were baptized, it was a symbol of your death to the world and to self, and that you were going to follow the Lord Jesus. And again, uh, Paul 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do, do not you judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. So, springboarding off of what Paul said there, you know, I, I'm not preaching against HBO, Netflix, uh, Sky, Net, or whatever it might be, Game of Thrones, and, and all this or that. What I'm preaching against is when you, a person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, goes and watches and listens and partakes of such things. Remember the verse here in verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Um, I was just thinking as I was going to uh, speak about these things, it's one thing for a man of God or a woman of God to, to be tempted. Well, let me see what the buzz is about and, and to, watch it, to watch it and then get caught up in it and then to feel dreadful and to be terrible. Uh, in Ephesians 4.30 it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And you feel awful. You've grieved the Holy Ghost and you know what you did was wrong and you confess it and you move on and and I think that's wonderful. We all stumble, we all have we all fall, we have our weaknesses. My concern would be that if you are a professor of the Lord Jesus and you're trusting on him for your salvation, and you can bathe yourself in these things, you can drink it in, wash it and think about it and meditate upon it, and there's no conscience. There is no Holy Spirit telling you, no, no, don't do this thing that I hate. Put it away. And you can go on. That would be my concern. And if I'm to actually speak against something, and I'm not saying I'm speaking against anyone here uh, who may be in that category, I don't mean to do that. What I, my words, I hope, would be therapeutic. My words would be helpful. My words, I hope, would bring you back to your senses that these things ought not to be. The Lord Jesus speaking on another topic to his disciples, it shall not be so among you. Any of us here that would be into those things and fellowshipping in that darkness, it shall not be so among you. And the chickens have come home to roost. And I'm up by saying that those two young boys uh, that they were victims. Again, I'm not saying that they weren't responsible and that there's not consequences for what was done. But what have we as a culture and of a people exposed our children to? In verse 12, it says, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So there's a tension there. Paul's saying, expose it, but at the same time, it's shameful to even talk about these things. But it says, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. There was a time, my time, and for many of you here as well was your time, that we would raise our children, and then the children would become of age that they were going to fly the nest, not to keep using examples of chickens and birds and all that, <laughs> but that they were going to leave. And it was very common for a mother to tremble for her son or for her daughter. She would tremble because they were going to leave the sanctity, the confines, the, the protective nest, and they were going to go out into the world. There was a time when children would, be, would come of age and they were going to leave that protective custody of their home and their parents, and they were going to go to the big city. And a mother's heart would tremble the things that their son or their daughter would be exposed to, the temptations, the bad company that would come to them. And they would tremble, and if the mother and the father were godly, they would pray that, that their child would be kept as they would go into the military or into industry or college or whatever it might be. And in verse 12 there, it says, which are done of them in, in secret. But now the danger is actually in our homes. The danger is in our pocket. It might be on your belt clip. And what before where the home was, there was sanctity there and there was protection. Now, 
Satan and the darkness have come into the home. And we read there that those things that are done in secret, they're not done in secret anymore. I remember when um, some of these magazines, they were in a, a cover, uh, like a, a, um, a brown cover, these magazines, if they were on the shelf or some people would have pornography sent to their home, there was a brown cover around the wrappers because it was, it was shameful and you didn't really want your neighbors to know or if you were going to pick it up at the newsstand, you'd kind of look this way and that. And sadly, in today's day and age, there is no more shame as we read these things uh, in Ephesians and as we read that we're meant to be light, that we're not meant to be darkness, that we're not to have fellowship with these things that, that I've been speaking about here. And sadly, it's only going to get worse and worse. The darkness is only going, I don't know how much darker it can get than it already is, but, but there we have it. And so my call on the Sunday morning here is to come out. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 16, 17, and down to verse uh, 7, verse 1, it says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then the main point here in verse 17, 2 Corinthians six seventeen, Wherefore, come out. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. There's just one last point I wanted to make here in speaking about these things. Uh, the story that I had read, uh, the one boy, sometime before the murder and the terrible things that were done, he approached a school friend. And that's, as I had mentioned earlier, he approached and says, do you want to kill somebody? And right there, whoever that other young teen was, he had a choice to get away, to not listen, not fellowship with this, or to listen, to be enticed, to be attempted, and to go along uh, with, if I could use the word uh, friend there. Perhaps I'm speaking more to our younger, there's not too many of the younger uh, lads here today, so many of them are gone. But the Bible speaks about the company you keep. That the company you keep can be a blessing, but the company you keep can certainly be a curse and be very dangerous and toxic. And we would find a few verses in, in Proverbs. Proverbs 24.1 Be not envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them, for their heart studies destruction and their lips talk of mischief. And I just thought of that one boy just going to the other there. Says his heart was studying destruction and his lips were talking mischief. And that other boy's ears listened and took that talk of mischief in and joined with him to do it. In Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10, 11, 12, and 15. And again, for our younger men here. Please listen, it's certainly true for all of us. My son, if sinners entice you, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. And I would just close with that admonition to all of us, but most importantly, perhaps to the younger people with us here. Just watch out for the company you keep. And God forbid that you would be the friend or the evil company that others should stay away from. And these admonitions are all 
here for us. And God help us in the day and age in which we live. All we have is that little light. We sang about it and Deirdre prayed about it earlier there. I have my little light. And it said, let not Satan blow it out. And he wants to blow it out by causing you to have fellowship with darkness and have that light go out. But protect it. Let it shine. Yes, it's a little light. It's my little light of mine. It's my little testimony for Jesus. It's my little word of the scriptures to somebody here and there but to let it shine and to not let it be blown out. Another verse in in Ephesians chapter 4, 27, neither give place to the devil. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed unto the day of redemption. And then just closing in my thoughts here, hopefully the word spoken for, for those of us that are trying to let our little light shine, to protect it, to be strengthened, to be encouraged, to keep on keeping on. For those of us who have fallen into darkness and you've been fellowshipping with Satan, these things ought not to be. If Jesus is your Savior and if the Holy Ghost is in you, if you're the temple of God, these things ought not to be. You you must repent. And Father, we thank you for these words, Lord, hard words. The Lord Jesus in his prayer said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. We pray, Lord, that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Lord, we pray that you would protect us, that you would keep us in this day, in this age in which we live. And you would give us grace, Lord, to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. And then if we walk in the light as you are in the light, we have fellowship with one another And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And Father, we ask through the Lord Jesus. Amen.